Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is James Ehrlich. I'm founder of Regen Villages, which is a Stanford University spinoff company that I founded uh, in 2016 to realize the future of living, we hope, in self-reliant, regenerative, and resilient neighborhoods. Um, basically, uh, the whole concept is around food. It's around healthy, delicious, organic, biodynamic kinds of <clears throat> neighborhood access to delicious nutrition. I was inspired by the work of <clears throat> uh, neighborhood uh, Rudolf Steiner to delicious and Buckminster nutrition. Fuller. I was inspired and, uh, by the also work of the work uh, uh, coming uh, from Rudolf Australia in the 1970s around, around Mr. Fuller. Um, permaculture and, and this whole uh, concept uh, that you can incredibly establish um, the symbiotic this whole concept uh, of the neighborhoods around uh, healthy food symbiotic and, and um, delicious of kind of ingredients around uh, my my background is in both technology uh, and software kind of initially um, Coming my, out of New York, background is I was a video game designer and developer and initially, and um, had worked out coming out of New York to Northern California, designer, where I was surrounded by these very beautiful and, uh, organic biodynamic uh, farms, and, and then California that led me to uh, start producing a television cooking series farms, called Organic and Living, and that led me where the stories were more than just about the food and the farm to table experiences. They were also about where the stories were more than just about the strong and safe and resilient and this idea so, uh, that these multi-generational uh, families um, and of and different and kinds of backgrounds come together, come together multi and, uh, and be uh, happy and, 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 and have happy longevity. Come together so fast forward, I came to Stanford uh, University in 2012, and I got involved in so fast a forward, I research initiative um, in 2012, initially on this idea of the smart house and the energy positive house. And about five minutes into my research, I realized that the smart house Inside, inside of the dumb neighborhood houses, makes and about five, five minutes into my research. So I, I was inspired by the work of, of Dr. Suzanne Simmert from the Middle South. So I was inspired by the work of Dr. Suzanne Simmert from the Middle South. So I was inspired by the work of Dr. Sorry. So yeah, I was fascinated by the work of Dr. Suzanne Simmert from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, the work who had lovingly from uh, the coined the term the Wood Columbia. Wide Web, so, yeah, was versus by the work who had Suzanne lovingly uh, coined the term British the Wood Columbia. Wide Web. So, yeah, versus if I have who one on, sorry. Lovingly uh, coined the term the Wood Columbia. Wide Web. So, yeah, I don't. If I have who one on, sorry. Lovingly coined the term the Wood Wide Web. I don't. Sure. If I have who one on, sorry. And we're back. Uh, so yeah, I was inspired by this idea of trying to create a software connection really to, to nature. And, and uh, looking at this research from Dr. Suzanne Simard from the University of British Columbia, and also uh, the doctor of fungus, Paul Stamets, um, really, really brilliant uh, guy on this idea of um, this mycelial mycorrhizal network, which is, which essentially is um, the largest living organisms on earth are these mycelia bundles. They are a fungal inoculation into the, the, the roots of plants and trees and uh, under the forest floor. But they are a collaborative economy. It's a have need network that represents a long-term ledger. And this research actually proved that old growth uh, Douglas fir trees, for instance, were conveying all kinds of nutrients and goodies to these maple seedlings, different species trees, um, hundreds of meters away under the forest floor, essentially proving that the forest community uh, wants this seedling to come to maturity because someday it will have something interesting to, to offer. And I think it's actually a really beautiful metaphor, hopefully for uh, future human economic models. But this idea of designing based on mimicry, so you mimic nature <clears throat> and then the thought process <clears throat> excuse me, of our neurons, nerve cells, 
Um, most recently, cosmologically, uh, they've discovered that galaxies are actually interconnected with these thin fibers of, of dark matter. And when simulated, it looks very much like, like a mycelial network, which is essentially a mesh network. There's no single brain. It's intelligence at the point of sensing. And so I was really, really captivated and compelled with this idea that we could create a software stack that for the first time could understand the nutritional flows, food, water, energy, uh, waste to resource management, connectivity to these energy positive homes, smart autonomous mobility, anything pretty much that, that's neighborhood centric um, under one software stack. And again, at the heart of it is what I started with my talk, which is my inspiration, which is healthy, delicious food. And this idea that you can have these really beautiful patchwork of organic biodynamic, um, till-free soil environments that are almost a full menu practically uh, right next to, to where you live. And you marry that with some vertical farming, some controlled greenhouse farming with different kinds of freshwater shrimp, crawfish, several species of fish. Their waste is actually a nutrient flow that gets converted into nitrates that then gets pumped up to the top of these um, effluent-based lattices. The roots dangle in this nutrient-rich water, and the water comes by gravity back to the fish tanks purified. So it's an amazing way to save water and get increased year-round yield of biodiverse food. Uh, plus, of course, what people can grow next to their doors, and apartments, rooftops, etc. that you get the picture of, of overproduction and safe kind of food sources. So one of the other aspects of our work has really been in this idea of, you know, real full circularity. How can we feed the fish? How can we feed the chickens um, using animal waste and food waste so that basically you get a compost effect, but we use um, aquatic worms that are the perfect fish food. So it's a live input, high in omega-3, fat, calcium. The fish love them, of course. Um, this non-invasive fly species called black soldier fly larvae, BSF, the perfect uh, chicken food, high in calcium and fat. Both of these creatures eat their own weight every day in food and animal waste. But what's amazing and remarkable about them is that they, um, their waste is actually nutrient-rich, microbe-filled topsoil. And that can be then spread back out across pretty wide areas of um, farmland even you know, uh, gray field, brown field locations that need restoration, that this kind of nutrient generator can restore and bring back this abundant surplus of really delicious, flourishing, life-affirming kinds of, of, of um, ingredients. And that that web of life is really the, the component of this, um, metabolic integration, where the output of one system is not only the input of another system, but that through our village operating system software that we've been working on now for quite some time in development, that this software can actually learn from and improve how a neighborhood functions for the direct benefit of the people who live in those communities. And, and really the software has two main goals or, or uh, aspects to it. The first is on a design phase that it can look at previously uh, zoned agricultural ranch land and convert that into mixed use for new build developments for, for families to live without compromising the productive value of that land, rather um, overproducing those healthy ingredients uh, just by using software and creating the mechanism for that. And then the second part of the software is where the um, software itself runs the physical community. It becomes the operating system or the, the farmhouse server and just essentially uses all kinds of data, again, for the benefit of the people who are living in these beautiful lush communities. And then you can imagine from like an Elon Musk perspective that these neighborhoods can communicate with each other across climate zones and improve or mitigate against risk. And I'm off to say it's not Star Trek, it's not a holodeck, 
It's just really beautiful, vibrant place that multi-generational, cultural, socioeconomic level families um, can come together, but also that where people can age in place, where, where this idea of assisted living or senior living is really perverse, it's wrong. We need to be thinking about how we can bring uh, that wealth of wisdom back into the village infrastructure. And, and that these beautiful homes and, and, and systems can be really in harmonious uh, symbiotic relationship to each other. And then that symbiosis is stewardship of the land and, 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 and the right kind of, of, of animal husbandry that complements this whole kind of, of, of food ecosystem and living ecosystem. And so you're getting this whole picture now of a new kind of subdivision development that actually works for humanity. And it's not against you know, our best interests. And especially in the long term, that these communities can really flourish. Uh, the idea of garages and driveways is really yesterday. Uh, we need to be really looking at how autonomous transit will replace garages and driveways, um, shared mobility especially. Um, but that we can look at social affordable housing in a, in a much wider mix. And that um, all kinds of economic strata of communities can come together and live in these beautiful, vibrant places. Um, that we look at the building materials themselves, like for instance, mass timber. Um, the current state of the art of a whole, all wood build uh, building is now 22 floors. This idea that you can build these whole high rises or mid rises very quickly using these modular prefab elements that are constructed in a, assembly line environments. So they save on, on construction waste, they save on construction cost on site, and all of that savings can then be passed on to future residents, renters, uh, buyers, um, people who are you know, time sharing, whatever the, you know, the structure may be. Also looking at 3D extrusion and how we can look at printing these kinds of earthen material homes, uh, especially across urgently the global south, rural India, sub-Saharan Africa, all across ASEAN. Um, you know, I grew up in the New York area, New York City region, and so I'm not anti-city. I believe that we can look at urban retrofits, and there are ways of making, let's say, mid-rise buildings like this safer and more resilient, uh, especially if they have open space next to them. So these are some ideas that we can certainly look into going forward. Uh, but primarily our goal is near suburban, peri-urban and rural. That's our kind of our main focus. So Regen Villages is a very strange multinational startup. We're a Dutch holding company uh, for a variety of reasons. We have a subsidiary in, in Sweden, in the UK, uh, here in, in the US, um, one coming very soon to, to Canada and, and other parts of, of the world. Um, because we have this tremendous outreach of communities that really want Regen Villages and our village operating system software to take hold um, all across their countries. Um, we've essentially become the rolling stones of the modern eco-village movement. Um, 100 million plus web impressions, 25,000 plus families already registered and counting, um, amazing technical partners, uh, from all around the world with very strong, stable platforms to build these neighborhoods rapidly. Also because I continue my affiliation at Stanford University and the Stanford School of Medicine in what's called Stanford Flourishing, uh, we have this amazing opportunity to connect and collaborate with other universities uh, around the world. I'm also a faculty member um, at Singularity University as well. And, and here's the main punchline, uh, if you will that pre-COVID 12 trillion with a T US dollars left and, and, and divested from fossil fuel investments. Now in the midst of COVID, we're seeing progressive governments around the world, the EU, Canada, um, South Korea, New Zealand, proclaiming probably something close to 18 to 20 trillion additional dollars or euros focusing on um, what they're calling the green transition. 
And what that means is new kinds of jobs around new kinds of infrastructure, especially focusing on housing and, and, and especially in these, these areas that we have to be focusing on um, regenerative resiliency locally, especially food, water, energy, and waste. So we've published two UN Sustainable Development Goal platform briefs, myself and two other professors at Stanford, um, particularly on this idea of teasing out sovereign wealth and pension fund engagement and involvement. We're part of an EU Smart Rural Village Commission uh, that's been formed about 18 months ago. And we see that the future of living is in fact possible from the systemic approach from government funding, private equity, as well as providing reasonable impact returns. And that's really where we see how we can move forward. Um, so that's Regen Villages. I'm really grateful and, and honored to be able to share that with you today and um, absolutely open to questions. My email addresses are here on the screen and I really look forward to, uh, to widening and broadening this dialogue for how we can live for the next thousand years or more uh, in health and harmony on planet Earth. Thank you. Hi, Alessandra. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Thank you for that. I'm sharing my screen. No. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, so uh, yeah, I do have a question. Uh, this is uh, really, really cool. Um, I'm curious to know, uh, where this is already being actuated and and actually how close how close the real version is to the models that you built uh not uh physically but the whole system well we're you know because of covid of course we're we're a little stunted in for a number of reasons with our uh, our physical development plans, but our software, our village operating system software is moving forward really nicely. And we're making, you know, fantastic progress in, in how this is coming together. As I showed in a presentation, um, we have outreach and, and opportunities to fast track and get this built all across Europe, Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, the UK, um, and as well here in the US with some very big uh, partners and land opportunities in Canada. Um, and the goal really is to, to sort of set the moniker about how the new middle class is already sort of exiting from cities into more open areas. Um, but then primarily would be to bring this to the global south as quickly as we can. Are there any laws that are stopping you from doing any of it? There are a lot of laws, uh, as a matter of fact, um, mostly uh, put on the books about 100, 150 years ago um, by these, I'd say, I like to say sort of old white guys in top hats um, mm -hmm. who control- monocles. Exactly. Uh, district scale uh, heating and, and electrical and plumbing and, and, and sewage, et cetera. Um, and then there are material companies also and other vested interests that, that have um, a compelled interest to keep this kind of idea from, from really taking hold. But, but we know already that there's a business model is so strong for this and the demand is so strong for this that the adoption will start to come from these very same players who have been against us. Right. So how do you keep... Um Essentially, are you suggesting that each village would sustain its own economic well-being separately from each other? 
Well, see, so here's the situation. You know, the, there was a wonderful Rockefeller Foundation report that came out in 2012 uh, called, uh, um, well, it was basically, you know, the, the idea was that up until 1950, you had 75% um, of planet Earth's population living in small self-sustaining communities. They fed themselves, they hydrated themselves, they had their own economic models connected to their own small um, regional areas, right? And then the same report basically went on to say that by 2050, the opposite will be the case. You'll have 10 billion people, 75% of whom will be living in coastal megacities, completely disassociated from their, their natural resources and critical life support systems. So this is a recipe for, for disaster. So the, the truth is that, that every time you build an eco-village, you are creating the circumstances for, uh, re for um, increasing healthy outcomes, reducing burdens on healthcare systems, uh, increasing new economic model uh, output and creativity and productivity. Um, and then typically around an eco village, it's been proven that there's about a 25 kilometer public goodwill radius. That's an extension of this community supported agriculture, this ebb and flow of like curriculum and knowledge that goes in and out. Um, so yes, we believe uh, that, that building regen villages as these lily pads of self-reliant communities in conjunction with systemic government support and involvement, social housing, universal basic income, those kinds of things, that people can have a path to ownership and have self-worth and have hope. They wake up in the morning with something cool to do that they love. Um, it's not some you know, sort of demeaning job that they have to commute hours to go just to get to that same place where they're getting their basic needs met. Mm -hmm. So essentially economies were built around having our needs met. So if we go back to this point of meeting our basic needs, economies can then change seems sort of logical right if you're looking at it like having our basic needs met is a god-given right and here's a good way to accomplish that right um that's super cool um so basically at scale it really is relying on private interests and stakeholders in fossil fuels who are arguably dictating the legislation that happens uh, to kind of start shifting their focus on investing in opportunities that can be equally as um, lucrative financially, but cause less impact environmentally. Well, I think, I think that what you're hitting, you know, is, is an important nail on the head, which is greed. Um, we have to rethink business models away from greed, uh, where the new greed, if you will, is in compassion and in building um, these long-term spreadsheets that can prove out happy longevity and reduce burdens on, on government. Then, you know, that, that's a different kind of impact model financially and, and a reward system based around that. I think that's really important, but there's a lot of money already out there. Um, trillions. Trillions. That, that really wants, that desperately needs asset-backed, securitized investment that has, even if it has one or 2% annualized return, that's much better than they're seeing from any kind of treasury note. So this is kind of, you know, I'm trying to really play the same game um, there's a wonderful you know, Buckminster Fuller quote, which says, if you want to build something, don't mm -hmm. fight. Uh, make a new model that makes the old one obsolete. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Um, I guess the other thing I wanted to know about was, so how do you, at scale, how do you deal with um, volume of people, uh, housing. Yeah. Are Alex, are we done? Yeah.
Yeah, hey. Are we out of time? Oh, good. Yeah, so curious just how I saw the sort of modular prefab high rises. Uh, mm -hmm. But then you start going into this like J.G. Ballard-esque kind of like dystopian vision that is just due to like how many people there are in the world. Is it like the lily pads? Some people participate and some people don't. Like no, it's, it's, I, it's a really great question. Really what it comes down to is as a species, we, we inhabit two to three percent of the available landmass. OK, we don't have to build on the water. We don't have to go and do seasteading to get this done. There's plenty enough land, especially in the peri-urban and rural areas that have literally been neglected now for the better part of almost a century. So um, really what it's about is that we can create a certain amount of density with those high rise, you know, wood structures, for instance, um, as long as you have adjacent open space, okay, that can support food, water, energy, waste to resource management for that density. But if you build enough of these, kinds of communities across the landscape of peri-urban and rural areas that are, that are networked together, interconnected, supporting each other um, with a sort of substrate of improvement data, right? For their benefit, not, as, not making people a product, right? Mm -hmm. But that the data is there to support their thriving and flourishing, then um, we can achieve density. We can actually balance um, you know, where we're going. I'm not saying we're going to take Mumbai from 37 million people down to 5 million people. Right. Prevent Mumbai from going from 37 million people to 50 million people. That's huge because Mumbai right now is um, 800 meters down coming up brackish for water. Mm -hmm. So they're trucking water in every day for a city of 37 million people. How long do you think that can last for? It's without collapse. So band aid, yeah. Well, um, I don't know how much I could ask you questions for the next five hours. I don't know how much time we have, though. I'm happy to do another call because I love these questions. They're so great, and they're really thought provoking, and I really appreciate it. And 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 I'm again, I'm really honored to participate and be part of this 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 dialogue. So we can set up another call, and if your community is interested in having another call. You know, we can dig into some of these other issues and, and things. We know we really have to fix things and we have the tools and the technology. It's not a matter of science, technology or physics. It's a matter of money and political will. Right. Imagine? Right. Which is the thing that you're up against. That's why I was asking about the laws, because, you know, sometimes you just got to do it um, and put that's my belief is that you need to flood the market with the things that you want to see in legislation so that you can create use cases for people to kind of get behind new laws, you know? Right. Right. I mean, look, Musk saying that he can, he can, you know, uh, put a million people on Mars and, uh, you know, for a hundred thousand dollars each, they can own a house on the Mars. And that's incredible. I think that's an amazing feat, you know, exit velocity, distance, you know, all of the, let's just say, really uninhabitable kind of challenges there. Um, why can't we do that here uh, and, and make it for everybody as much as possible? So I'm not anti-Elon, I'm a big fanboy, by the way. Um, I, just, I just think we, we have to look uh, terrestrial first before outside. <laughs> that's a good that's that's probably a good place to start I, I feel like elon's like oh they're all burning let's just get out of here we'll go to mars because the earth is the earth has no too. hope that is bummer, too. so but, you, know. you know this is this is this kind of incredible wealth that is accumulated into just a few people's hands and, um, and there are so many solutions that, that they could, that wouldn't even sort of dent their, their net worth mm -hmm. that could be replicating self-fulfilling prophecies that would in turn actually feed most of their business models anyway. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm always at odds with this disconnect 
Um, but there's there's been some good Stanford research on the on this idea that as people accumulate wealth, they become less less empathic and compassionate. Well, I think they'll start to realize for their own uh, economic interests. Um, I have worked in the startup world for a long time, and it is my crucial understanding right now that that the entire uh, startup economy is gonna, we're definitely gonna see people moving into more cooperative structures um, and sort of like flat organization hierarchies and, and stuff like that. So if they can adopt cooperative structures, then, then that, that will benefit them economically too. But uh, Alex is texting me that we're out of time, even though I could nerd out on this. I'm grateful for this and, and thank you so much. And I look forward to the next steps in our dialogue. So thank you, Alex, for, for inviting me and, uh, and for this lovely conversation. Bye. Thank you.